everyone, and welcome to the 17th episode of Slime Time, the official Dragon Quest Dragon's Den podcast. This is one of your hosts, Platy M3. And this is your other host, Liam Land, a Quest of the Stars multiplayer public service announcement. Go for a combo meal. Get your food ready. Check your food, please. Stare. <laughs> Uh, I guess you'd still got to be playing this game and doing multiplayer to understand all that. Oh, that's right. You quit. I forgot. Uh, yeah, one of the tricks with uh, Dragon Quest of the Stars is that a lot of players are communicating through little stickers that we send each other that have occasionally English or occasionally little cutesy poo figures. And, um, and it's really obnoxious trying to communicate with other people because some people just cannot figure out how to communicate and some people just don't want to communicate. So <laughs> always trying to organize multiplayer is a bit of a hit or miss kind of operation. Ah, uh, so those are some of the uh, little stickers that you can do. Yeah. I wish you could do custom stickers and just, you know, Oh yeah. That'd go for well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it just comes into a huge troll party. Use but, your uh, fucking food. <laughs> dumbass. Yeah, yeah. Get your food ready. <laughs> motherfucker. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, um, there's a lot of, there's definitely a lot of international players. You see the stickers come up and they're in French sometime. They're in, uh, um, some of them are in like Chinese kanji and stuff. So you do get a sense that you're playing international players. Um, and, uh, maybe there's a communication barrier there or just maybe the person doesn't have the right food for the combo meal, um, for the, the, the yeah, it the, could be that, but if you're a double ro revocated level 86, you should have, <laughs> Yeah, I, would think, I would think you can yeah. have you have at least one flavor of dumpling just pick that one and we'll adjust for you exactly yeah, right i i'm assuming that people don't just jump right into multiplayer and they like tackle some of the single player first to get some of the, the some of those combo meal options but um but yeah it is pretty obnoxious when uh the worst thing is like when you've got you're hosting and um you're you're waiting you could be waiting up to like five minutes or more uh for people to to join and then there's the one guy who won't choose his food and so your your other guys who have chosen their food and maybe are high level start bailing on you because of that one one guy so it's nice that you do party have... has become a waste of their time oh yeah totally it's nice that you get the option to uh to kick them out if you actually go into and choose the uh magnifying glass you can go in and boot. Uh, or i've just... been ha having more problem with the high level players not paying attention to their food i don't know if they just set it on auto and don't care they figure <laughs> they're just going to blow through the level anyway just trying to get the bonus items but yeah i've i've gotten down to where i just give them 30 seconds and yeah. if they don't pick their food, I boot them out. No, oh, I, I give them 10. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Well, I'm in a fun spot because I picked the base level class, and those actually don't get to revocate. So my strongest guy is stuck at level 99, and I can't do a darn thing about it. I can't oh. actually progress. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I did the dancer. I, I, I started with the dancer and maxed that out, and I can't go anywhere. So I got to restart from the ground up, essentially, oh, for all right, the others. Right, right. Yeah, my... my, my um, uh, my plan so far is to just get 50 and everything and then start leveling up the uh, the other classes. You know, what's up? At least we'll it was the that toilet flush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, puff puff hour. <laughs> I, I want to have Jacob on so I can give him crap about that. <laughs> Pardon the you, pun. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to give him crap about the toilet? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know who I don't know who that was, but there was definitely a toilet flush in there. And then I my immediate thought was like, oh crap, everyone's gonna think that was me. So I had to call it out. I was like, are you guys going to the bathroom over there? <laughs> I am certainly not. <laughs> What's hilarious is I can remember where I was hearing that conversation driving down the road. <laughs> it's seared into his memory. It really yeah. is. <laughs> a flush of ages. People through the years, they remember when they shot when the Challenger exploded, when Kennedy got shot. Matt remembers where he was when that conversation occurred. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's took it to a really dark place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as you may realize, rejoining us tonight, we have from the Dragon's Den, our resident Dragon Quest Heroes expert, Brother Jaybird, and site owner, Wootus. <laughs> Great to be back. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time. I missed you guys so much. I mean, it feels like just yesterday or it just feels today. Like something. A couple of minutes ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it feels like something, all right. <laughs> well, 
tonight we're going to pick right back up where we were um give you a couple more questions to answer about yourself but then we're going to get right into dragon quest heroes 2 yeah but before we do that let's get to know a little bit more about our guests um so brother jaber there's very good reason we invited you on and to come back here so soon um if anybody else goes to the den and they look at the dragon quest heroes subsection of the forum that forum the top like seven to ten most recent topics all have you as the most recent post (laughs) yeah i'm sorry about that (laughs) um so what is it about these games that really you enjoy so much there's not really a very clever answer for that i just find them to be very fun um I enjoy it. the The gameplay is easy to get into. Um, the The scenarios are engaging. Um, there's a There's a very good, There's probably some technical theory term for it, but I just I find it easy to get into a sense of flow with these games. I enjoy pretty much all the gameplay aspects about them. So um, they were there. They were easy to get into. I found them very fun. Now, if I were writing now, if I were writing on the den, I could give you like three or four paragraphs of analysis about <laughs> this. But you know, I think you're talking in my brain doesn't work the same way (laughs) well i remember yeah a month and a half ago i guess late february early march um when i posted on the den i was like oh my gosh i'm gonna be on a podcast um on one of the rp gamer podcasts about dragon quest heroes one and two and other muso games anything that i should uh really sound smart about and I, yeah, you gave me the five paragraph essay right there. Which yes, was... I did. I feel like <laughs> full of memes though, because I know I know I can get tedious. No man, I read all of that, and that's when I texted Liam. I'm like, hey, what, once once I record this other podcast for another site, we got to do, we got to have Brother Jaybird on ours. He's a handy nerd to have around. <laughs> um, so series wide, have you uh, any favorites or least favorite characters or monsters? Oh gosh, uh, favorites. Um. Well, I mentioned this last round, but uh, my favorite character from the Hero series is Lucius because he manages. He he's not a very deep character. There's no character arc or anything to get involved in, but he manages to balance a very specific set of flavors that I find very appealing. He's the tactician that nobody listens to, but he's also got a lot of heart inside of him, and I and I really appreciate that balance. I really appreciate that balance because that's not a that's not a combination you see very often. Um, he would be my favorite male character in all of all of uh, DQ. Now, my favorite female character is uh, Aaron from Nine, who also shows up in Heroes Two. Um, but Aaron, I find very appealing. Um, in what I, way? I, yeah. <laughs> How do I phrase this without sounding like one of the worst people off 4chan? Um, Aaron is a Aaron. Aaron is a well-made character in a way that not a lot of Dragon Quest characters are. Um, a lot of DQ characters kind of suffer from being good sketches that they don't do anything with, and from being kind of bad sketches that they do a lot with. Um, so, I mean, for example, uh, Jessica from 8 is a well-thought-out character. So there's a very definite image and flavor they were going for with Jessica, but over the course of 8, they never really get around to doing anything with her. Um, Aaron, on the other hand, has a very specific place and set of circumstances in the game she's from. Um, she's a very specific character type, uh, relevant to the themes of the game. She's got, and, and she's got actually not a lot of story because, uh, nine doesn't go into a lot of story for each of these characters, but she, they take time to explore a lot of her backstory, which I really appreciate. Um, I, I think I must've written it down on the forum somewhere where Aaron has like two secret legacies. Cause she, this is good. Sorry. Spoilers. Spoilers for nine. Uh, Aaron has... A secret legacy on both her dad's side and her mom's side, but you don't get around to the mom's side until the DLC, which really sucks because you don't get the DLC anymore. Um, but I like that she she's a very well thought out and used character in Dragon Quest, and that's very rare to find in a lot of what in a lot of places. Um, a lot of old Dragon Quest characters didn't get that much definition until the remake showed up and started throwing in party chat for all the old games yeah and and aaron's um plot uh start is is at the very beginning of the game too mm-hmm. which is uh 
pretty fantastic story arc for even just opening up the whole Quester's Rest and, and all the different options that you get. She basically mm-hmm. introduced you to all that between her and Pat, and uh, Patty. Um, yeah. So did you uh, did you prefer the higher res Eren from DQH2 or the lower res Seal Hands version from uh, from DQ9 on the DS? Well, the low Seal version has, an adva- has, a, has a bit of an advantage on the higher res version because she's got a meme. It's a very small meme you have to go out of your way to find, but there's the, there's two scenes in the game where she lifts up this big old heavy object, including like the uh, the uh, incredible entertainer trophy, and then the crackpot. And she does it in the exact same pose, in the exact same way, with the exact same background. I was like, this is a meme worth having. So the, she's got that advantage. Um, I have no preference for art style, though I will admit, uh, in Heroes 2, Aaron happens to be in charge of the dimensional dungeons. So she has something that actively repulses me, even though, you know, that's not <laughs> <technically purple. laughs> Oh, man. How about that's... least favorite characters? Oh, gosh. Um, another Heroes character, not Heroes, Heroes 2, uh, would be Lazarel, uh, the main character from Heroes 2. Um, I was the dual not... Dual swords guy. Yeah. Purple hair, dual swords, won't shut up. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I was I was not really impressed with the heroes selection in uh, Heroes Two um, because it's very de- easy to see where exactly they went with these characters and what they did with these characters was they took the heroes from Dragon Quest Heroes One, they swapped their genders uh, or swapped the personalities for each gender. Um, and that was pretty much it. So instead of the uh, cool, clear-thinking, tactical male of Lucius and the hot-blooded Aurora, who has no patience for any of Lucius's tactics, you got the hot-blooded male uh, Lazarel, who was pretty much just hot-blooded, and that was it. And then you had Teresa, who was who didn't even get the tactics from Lucius. She was just not hot-blooded, and that was pretty much it. It's like, okay, these are these are these exist. These two characters exist. That's fine. But Lazarel, uh, Lazarel loses points with me because what Lazarel does is he always crows about his about the victories they have. So he'll, whenever you beat a mission, he'll go he'll go and say something like, "Yeah, we're unstoppable." And I'm sitting there going, "This mission was a nightmare. We got stopped like thirty times." <laughs> Shut up, Lazarel. <laughs> Uh, and in the main series, I don't have a least favorite uh, girl. The girls are all more or less uh, there at the very least. But my least favorite person would probably be the protagonist from Eleven. Um, without getting into spoilers, um, more or less ha- just my problem with him is that he has no emotional range at all. He wanders through life with the same wooden expression on his stupid face every time something serious happens. So it's impossible to sympathize with him at all. It's it's almost impossible to care about what happens to this guy because he very clearly doesn't himself. Maybe it's just the hair. Could be. Could be. The hair is kind of soul draining on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. Drained mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I do have one favorite monster who is Robin Hood, which is kind of cheeky because Robin Hood is basically a character you get to fight. Um, but Heroes did Heroes did a good job with Robin Hood. They managed to inject a lot of flavor into him by do, basically by making him kind of like a meaner version of Yangus. He's got the same Cockney accent. He's more he's the thug. He's pushing his pushing his underlings around. I just I just find his voice very appealing. He's fun to fight. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I remember him going back to Dragon Quest Three. It was funny. Kandar, originally he was, and I mean, I remember him on the NES days. Uh, probably one of my least favorite mechanics in a game. Like, you beat a guy, why do you have to fight him over and over and over again? He kept getting away. <laughs> and getting stronger. And yeah, like, my God, let's take this guy out, man. Yeah, he's got the hyperbolic time chamber on his side. <laughs> <laughs> he's like Dr. Wily. He just keeps get, he's like saying, I'm sorry, and then getting away, and then just coming back strong. All right, so uh, what are some of your favorite mechanics in Dragon Quest games? You like the monster collecting, classes, casinos... Throughout the series, what do, what do you really enjoy? Well, I, I I'm the, I'm the kind of nerd who's a sucker for world building, so I like getting the information on how the how the universe of a game works. So what I tend to like is the monster compendium, especially those that have flavor text, because I, I tend to just glance over the stats because I don't care how much gold the monster drops. Uh, but you know all the little flavor text about the monsters, um, like what they do, what they like to do, what are their behaviors, um, how friendly are the slimes? Not very friendly. Um, 
stuff like that. Um, I do like the monster recruitment from five. That was that was a pretty fun engagement. I liked that because it also had story building ramifications because it was an expression of the character's heritage as much as it was a mechanic. Hmm. Um, I'm not I'm gonna, I'm not a huge fan of the casinos or at least the casinos as such. I have the wrong spirit for them. I'm not I'm not a legitimate gambler. I, 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 use, I use the casinos a lot, mostly because they tend to have a lot of cool gear and there's, you know, one or two strategies to cheese them over the course of time. So I just kind of do that and I get all the gear and then I leave and I never look back. Hey, that's how they're supposed to be used. Get the gear. They're a yeah, tool. No, that's why I don't, I don't feel too guilty about it. <laughs> so do you have any favorite uh, official Dragon Quest merchandise or stuff made by fans? I'm, I'm a horrible fan. I don't have any merch. I don't. I, I, I've seen fan art over the years. I, I don't know if that counts. All right. That's okay. I, I personally don't have very much merch either. Uh, Liam, he's probably drowning in it. He's had to offload it. He's got so much. I, yeah, well, you make I, your own merch, Platt. That doesn't matter. Yeah, 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 <laughs> That's true. <exactly. laughs> yeah, I got a lot of stuff in Japan. I'm now either I've sold or I'm, I'm having to sell just because uh, um, I have a family now and, and don't have a ton of space in the small apartment. All right. Before we get into uh, Dragon Quest Heroes 2 here, we do have to play Mary Thwack Puff Puff again. And, uh, I've got it secret from all, all three of you here, so none of you know this one. Um, since we are going to talk Dragon Quest Heroes 2, they're all there. Sorry I didn't get as funny as Liam did on our last episode. but um... <laughs> Is the ducky lady in this one? Does anyone know? Is she in, in DQH2? I no. really thought she was. No, the, witch is in, the witch is in 2. Is it the witch that does the item creation? Does she say she it? She does, does the alchemy. She says something similar to it. Yeah. Okay. Then maybe that's what I'm thinking of. That, is that in that gra- grandma's the 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 witch from Dragon Quest uh, six and and your story. No, 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 no. The um the well fed one from Dragon Quest Heroes two who <laughs> who's sitting around the alchemy pot. Oh, okay. <laughs> the well fed one. <laughs> she is. She, she is cute. Uh, all right. Well, here's your here's your three choices, and none of these are well fed at all. Um, because we're gonna go with Desdemona with her large axes. Um, and since we didn't get around to this pairing with uh either Westy or Phil when we talked uh Dragon Quest Four with both of them, let's talk about the sisters Maya and Mina. So oh, wow. Desdemona, Maya, Mina. Okay, well uh, that's actually really easy for me. Mary, Mina, uh, Puff Puff from Maya. It'll, it's it's it'll be short. It'll be over soon. Uh, uh and unfortunately, Black by default goes to Desdemona. Oh, Mina saw in her crystal ball that you were you were gonna marry. Yeah, I like Mina. Mina Mina's pretty good. I don't dislike Maya. With, I dislike hold Maya. on, you're, you're oh, marrying no. one sister oh, and puff no. puffing the other. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I know better than to marry a black hole when it comes to money. That's all. <laughs> Good point. Speaking of casinos, <laughs> the only one who's allowed to spend money at the casino is me. Oh, that's great. All right, Liam, what are you what are you doing there? Uh, I don't have an answer for this yet. Can you can you go to can you go to Woodis next? <laughs> next. <laughs> Woodis, you got the answer there? Oh. I'll go Mary Mina, Puff Desdemona, and Thwack Maya. But All right. Thwack by default. <laughs> is that Thwack by default, or you really got some reason to Thwack her there? I, the casino thing was a pretty good uh, rationale <laughs> on that, so I kind of strung with that, so I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, losing all the money in the casino, I'd probably have to say Thwack Maya as well. <laughs> My apologies to Anjali Mahindra. Uh, <laughs> oh, this um, again. <laughs> then she's I got guess... a great personality. It's just she's terrible with yeah. money. With fantastic, fantastic voice acting, just not a good gambler. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, yeah, then I, I guess I would have to say uh, marry Mina and Puff Puff Desdemona. Yeah, Mina just became the number one bachelorette behind her own <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll I'll change it up a little here because uh, I say Thwack Maya, and I'm gonna go with this because in my in Dragon Quest I'm all about physical attacking. I very rarely cast offensive ma- magic, so honestly, Maya I, has like never been on my radar for any game to play as whatever. She's a bench person. She's hanging out in the wagon. Just Thwack her, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which um. And I will uh, marry Desdemona, 
my favorite character in Dragon Quest Heroes 2, by far, Mary Desdemona, which uh, leaves Mina as the Puff Puff by default. I, I got no... I, I got no reason for that one. Just I'm gonna puff puff by default. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cloud oh, is about it. He, he he doesn't have a thwack by default. He's got a puff puff by default. Exactly. <laughs> He's an honorable man. I've so got I've got puff. strong feelings the other ways, but like Mina, whatever. And the she whole was... Maya Maya losing all the money was that was just a <laughs> mechanic. To, that was just like some plot to get over the fact that the developers didn't want to like transfer money. But then yeah. she kept losing money. Into your chapter five <laughs> bank account. <laughs> oh, always good. All right, so let's get into Dragon Quest Heroes 2 here. Um, I'll start off with my little uh, Platinum 3 cliff note version, or I guess it'd just be Platinum 3 notes. Um, but this game did have a little bit more story than the original, it was a little more nuanced. Um, they, they, it was really focusing around twins and kings and events that had happened a thousand years ago um, in this realm where uh, peace has reigned for a thousand years after uh, the big bad guy a thousand years ago did some stuff. Um, and then this agreement was had between all the other nations that, you know, we're not going to war. So peace has reigned supreme here for a thousand years um, until, hey, surprise, they need to make a game about it. So, you know, things have to happen. Um, and it, you're going kingdom to kingdom, trying to keep the peace while at the same time fighting. And there's things going on behind the scenes that are getting kingdoms turning towards each other. Um, your king, or the, the great king that rules over all the realm, because each little kingdom has its own ruler, but there's a great king over all the realm. He ends up playing a big part. Um, in turning bad, and even it, you were talking about Liam. What is it? The uh, in Zaro becoming part of your quest after you defeat him. That happens right off the bat in this game because you got Caesar, who is your friend um, from another kingdom, and he brings an army to attack you. Once you defeat him, he kind of realizes, hey, he's being played for the fool. Um, and these things that are going on behind the scenes and you progress through the story and you find out a little bit more about the uh, two main protagonists um, who was it Lazarel and can't remember the girl this one Teresa Teresa yep so I mean it, it had a little bit more complex story it involved uh, it changes to a more open world thing that you can just walk from place to place instead of a go to this place mission on a flying airship um it, it added a lot of different things and i believe that and i think the story was evolved too i mean this only came out a year and a half after the first one but uh they made some good leaps and bounds here jaybird yeah. what did you yeah yeah um heroes 2 was i had a much more definite idea about where i wanted to take the story um it was a lot it was much more ambitious a lot more lore uh heroes 1 was comparatively straightforward um in the meantime, it was it was it was almost generic to a fault. The story from the first game, because uh, like okay, we have the world tree, we've got this kingdom here, and then bad stuff happens, and the bad stuff is destined, prophesied to take over, and we gotta stop it because we got the good stuff. I mean, the most they were able to get to was they named their their prophesied figures the children of light and the children of darkness which is not exactly going very far in the world building department but um heroes 2 makes a point of okay we've got like seven or eight different dedicated nations here each of them has a different theme we've got the desert we've got the harbor we've got three dedicated monster kingdoms we've got the one in the center keeping the peace um I was I was slightly disappointed, however, with uh, the Heroes 2 story, because despite having the more definite concept, what they did was um, they spent all their time developing this mystery about what was going wrong with the famous piece than they did actually talking about kings and twins. So, I mean, they throw the, they throw the title at us, and they throw the basic themes at us, and then they ignore it for most of the game, and then suddenly they get to the finale and they realize, oh, wait, this was a game about kings and twins. Let's do a lot of that right now. And I was like, okay, this has no continuity with anything you were doing before, but okay, this is what we're doing now. Kings and twins are now a thing. So I, I, I struggled to really get behind that sudden change in the storytelling department. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the, 
about the uh, the more open world. Oh, I love me. I loved it. It was it was it was phenomenal. I there's been a very specific type of game um, that was basically an open uh, that did not exist when I was in high school, to my knowledge. But which basically this game clo- uh, fulfilled for me, and basically what amounts to an open world hack and slash. And I loved it. I love being able to go through and being able to do all the all the spe- spells and special moves in real time in an open world where you can explore. And it was phenomenal. Um, I'm, in fact, I'm a little spoiled by it because I'm disappointed they didn't do more. Uh, they have dedicated models and re- for specific regions like the Kingdom of Harba, where you're, where the main characters are from. And the and the Kingdom of Accordia, and I think even the Kingdom of Oh gosh, Ingenia, that was it. Uh, where you can wander around and explore, but they use these they use these specific kingdom models in a very limited way. And I would have loved to be able to go around and explore them uh, in a more open sense when I wasn't on a mission. But no, no, they only give me very specific mission content, and I only get to go through and explore them during those times. I was disappointed because they could have had open sections for that, and they didn't. I like the, um, I like the, 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 what I liked most about the open world is how seamless it went from the walking theme into into battle musically, but also, um, it, it, you, you're just you're walking, and then it transitioned into battle immediately, and with like no change of the scenery. It just, uh, I, I thought it was uh, pretty well done. Yeah, I thought that too. It was pretty neat that I mean, you would see them on, and and I don't really remember this as much from the first one. It could have been exactly the same, but that oh, that first area in Dragon Quest Heroes too. I remember walking, and you're just watching like the slimes and the slime knights like sleeping weren't that like the night off the slime and just laying against them sleeping or something like that Mm -hmm. and as you got within a certain range you'd wake up pop on and you're right that battle theme would start and suddenly you were in the middle of a battle but yeah since it was so open world there was you you weren't constantly having to fight monsters you might walk for 30 seconds before you get to the next more grouping version of them um there were just lots of spaces where not it wasn't all maw keepers and monsters spawning like crazy there was just a lot of places that you could go nooks and crannies and exploring and dead end paths and whatever to find stuff and it was just more 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 well and then they kind of had those hidden areas where you had to uh, was you had to have a certain character with you to gain access to yeah yeah you'd have to have specific um characters with skills like you needed carver to knock over trees yeah so that was kind of mm-hmm. that was neat how they did that yeah i remember early on like was it maya i think you needed the or maybe it wasn't even um maribel you needed to have the flame skill to burn through vines or something Oh, Matt said the M word. Oh God, I wasn't gonna talk about it this episode. Not <laughs> because he likes her secretly. He's just uh, with her. Yeah, I'm gonna po- <laughs> I'm gonna make the album artwork for this episode just the picture of her perler bead character in the trash can. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like did game, uh, game did game. your impression of Maribel improve or get worse from hearing the voice act? I don't even remember that so much because he never picked off. her. I never picked her, unless, and I never. Unless you had to, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I I barely, I didn't touch her at all. Like a ten foot pole. You left Stay her away. back and fish. No. <laughs> I liked her in this game actually. When you get her, uh, there she's got uh, boomerang skills, giga throw and firebird throw, and when you get them up, she's actually really good uh, DPS character actually damage per second. She's got mm-hmm. she's got a very specific niche that she works in, and it's she takes down giant monsters very well because you can use giga throw and firebird throw right on top of each other so she'll just be standing there and she's got her attacks running automatically when she's already launched them and this giant monster will just be sitting there not able to respond to what's hitting it and it's just it, it's this phenomenal way to take down things like trolls uh trolls and lucifers and i just love doing it because her idle animation is she she folds her hands behind her back so she's so there are these situations where she's fighting against some giant monster and she falls into her idle animation while her attacks are still going on. And so she's just politely waiting there, bored, while this monster is dying in fire and light. She's just waiting for them to finish dying already so she can move on to the next one. And it's this phenomenal image. I love it so much. Hmm. See, and I'll be honest, I playing these games, 
I don't know what it was. Maybe it was it was it only a year and a half after the first Dragon Quest Heroes. And honestly, I did so much of the post game for the first game, maybe six to eight months after it came out even. So it was less than a year than I had just sunk a second 70 hours into that first game. But when this game came out, it first of all, I didn't like Maribel. Screw that. Um, I think we've talked about that enough. So, you know, forget that. And I, um, Carver from Dragon Quest VI, again, screw him, the whole Dragon Quest VI cast. Um, but I, I don't know. The, the new ones didn't interest me so much, the people that were there. Um, the old ones I had just played with so much. I went through this whole game basically completely ignoring all the old characters. I loved Desdemona. I absolutely loved Desdemona. And Caesar, I thought, had a, I mean, it wasn't a huge character arc, but right at the beginning, I pissed me off that, you know, I'm fighting this guy, what a tool, whatever. But really quickly, with like the first five hours, I was like, oh no, this guy's awesome. And I loved his great sword. Liam, we were talking about swords on the last episode, and no, this one, it actually made a difference that he had a great sword. I loved that. Um, and the two main characters, I believe they're the only ones that you can change their, their classes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. only uh, Lazarel and Teresa get classes. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to play around with that. So honestly, I did this whole game, unless it was specifically that I had to use them. I only use those four, like all the time. I did not play this as a Dragon Quest Heroes. I played it as Dragon Quest New People, <laughs> New Heroes. Yeah, they've got they've got a pretty solid all around cast this time, except for Lazarel and Teresa, who are obligatory. <laughs> um, except for the the main characters. <laughs> except for the main characters, they've got a, they've got a great cast, except for the main ones you have to play as. Um, yeah. So I, I like Cesar, too. I was a little... I never got around to playing Cesar uh, when I first started, but um, I did appreciate he had a good character arc comparatively compared to everything else in the game. Um, but it was there, and it was an arc, and I appreciated it immensely. I, I didn't get onto the Cesar hype train, though, until uh, the post, until I was playing the post game over the last winter because um, I discovered what his great sword actually did because uh, I was leveling up, him up to level 99 finally. I finally got around to leveling everybody up, and I got and I started using Cesar, and I go, okay, this is cool. Because Cesar's greatsword um, has different attacks depending on what elemental uh, setting you give him. Uh, and so he actually has a lot of customization options among the characters for himself. And I liked his, what was it, his ice element attack? where you can just kind of set him up on a different hill, aim him correctly, and you just start shooting shockwaves of, I think it was ice or water, at some of the enemies. And I was like, okay, this is a cannon. I like the cannon. I want to use the cannon more. That was cool. Yeah, I do remember that attack very well. I never got into Desdemona, though. I didn't really play her. Um, I never got around to it. And by the time I finally got around to her, I was like, I was tired of leveling everybody up. Because at the time, I, <laughs> because by the time I was able to, you know, seriously level everyone up to level 99, everyone was already like in their 80s and 90s. So I didn't get, I didn't get as much chance to really use her as everybody else. Because by the time I was through like maybe 60% of using the cast, I'd already leveled up the rest of them to level 99 simply by trickle down. Um, but I do, I do like that she has a little bit of intrigue in the story, and she's involved in the story in a substantial way, uh, which is more than some of the other side characters they've given you have suffered from. But she's part of the story, and I appreciate the part she's in. Uh-huh. What do you think, Brian? Uh, I really liked uh, Caesar's character. I really thought, just me and my na- naive self, thought he was going to be the villain through the whole thing. So when they turned him around to be an ally, I, I really liked that, and... He was fun to play with. Um, I did play with... I, I kind of mixed it up like I did the first game. I tried to rotate through everyone. I know there were some stations you had to use certain characters, but I kind of evened it out through everybody just to give them all play time. It wasn't quite as... I don't think Bianca was quite as... She returned in this one, right? No, no she didn't. No, actually. She did. So I didn't have a Bianca in this one like the first one that I kind of always went to. I kind of yeah, mixed we, it up. We all suffered that way. We all missed Bianca. Yeah. That's what I was thinking when I started to say that. I'm like, no, she wasn't there. Um, so I didn't have a, a favorite that I always went to. I just kind of mixed it up a lot. Yeah, I, I do kind of appreciate the game that way in that uh, by taking out all the, the easy-to-abuse options like Bianca and Nera, uh, they got they got rid of a lot of the 
stick to this one character and never branch out temptations but they kept Ner they kept terry and elena and they fixed those two by taking away the mp regen on crit so you couldn't um you couldn't simply just use the one character they would event they would eventually run out of mana and they would do it quickly so you kind of had to switch to somebody else mm -hmm. i remember i used the class system and i think it was the thief was that a thief class or um whatever that got the access to the bow and i made sure i had my reign of pain as quickly as i could <laughs> But I went looking powerful though, was it? No, it was not. It was not. It was... It's yeah, just what Brother Jaybird said. They they knew what they overpowered in the first game. Yeah. And like that MP gen on crit, because wasn't that the uh that's the way you made Reign of Pain like amazing in the first game was yeah, with you could boost the crit and you could get ma uh, magic regeneration on crit. Mm hmm And yeah, you, you did the you combine those together and you know, you're shooting twenty arrows, probably one of those or two of those is gonna hit a crit by boosting that up and then it regens the MP. And I mean, yeah, you could almost rain a pain for a full minute before you needed any sort of recharge in the first game. This game, it definitely was okay. You got to do it five, six, seven times. And then I had to switch to the other characters to just battle for a while. And I'd rotate back to, uh, and usually it was, uh, Teresa, right? Teresa, this game. Yeah. 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 Cause Aurora was the first game. It was usually Teresa. I had as that class. Although I did want to try to get them to the advanced classes, so I did rotate. Sometimes uh, our boy Purple Hair Lazarel was my Reign of Pain guy. It, that just didn't feel right, though. <laughs> yeah, no, I kind of kept Lazarel in the aggressive, um, the warrior, and I, the warrior, and I think I gave him the sage. I gave him the sage because the sage had the the heavy the heavy wands, mm -hmm. which also had sniping capabilities and multi hit. So it was like it was a poor man's substitute for Reign of Pain, but I liked it because he had lots more mana, lots more magic to go with it. Mm -hmm. And there were only what six classes in this one? There were a uh, warrior, priest, martial artist, thief, and then gladiator and sage, mm -hmm. which you had to unlock. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was it was a the system was there. You had to use it. Um, but yeah, it was pretty limited. And gosh, man, I missed the easy, easy, you know, maybe the 10-hour journey to get to level with 99 with anyone. I can't imagine how much time it took you. How did you get to level 99 with everybody? Um, well, I, I doubled up on... Um with other quests what i was doing was after the post game um i ended up just going through and filling out the compendiums and all the data from those because mm -hmm. i realized there wasn't a real concrete collection of all that data and so i figured okay i'm just gonna go and see if i could get these achievements and whatnot and so i did that and while i was doing that i would keep running around the dark world sorry that's a spoiler um oh and... we were we're spoiling everything about this game <laughs> okay good. you throw a spoiler alert up in front of it um, so, uh, while I was running around the dark world, I noticed that, uh, a lot of high level metals, liquid metals and metal king slimes would, uh, spawn. And every time I saw one, I would immediately make a break for it. I was like, okay, stopping my original quest or going for this now. Um, so I ended up fighting a lot of them. And as I was fighting a lot of them, I just can I, I would just collect more and more, uh, experience. And that was how I finally got there. Uh, I didn't pay much attention to it because I was focusing on everything else. And I realized, oh, everyone's fully leveled now. We're done. <laughs> how far did you get into the um, like the secondary? Because like, that was the one thing. This was like Dragon Quest Nine when you switched jobs, your your level reset. Mm -hmm. Like you could be uh, a fifty oh, level the... fifty warrior, but if you became some gladiator, if you open that up suddenly you're back to level one gladiator. Yeah, I think I stuck to three um, in in my one playthrough. I got Lazarel. Well, let me see it here. I got, I leveled Lazarel up normally until we started getting quests for other things. I needed to la level him up to level 20 in Thief because I wanted the Thief key. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to level him and um, either him or Teresa up to level 20 uh in other in all the base cast categories so that we could get the quests to unlock gladiator and sage and then what i did was uh i think at the end of it it was level 99 warrior level 99 sage i think i had uh lazarel somewhere like mid 40s for gladiator before i decided i just don't i wasn't interested in pursuing it anymore mm -hmm. so I, I stuck with uh, sage and warrior for Lazarel, and I think I did martial artist and priest for Teresa. All right, uh, Woodis, how far did you go in this game? 
I'm trying to remember. I should have loaded up my save file. I I know I got through the main story, but I don't think I got too far into the into the extra bosses again. Just like the first game, I think I hit a stumbling block with the first couple and just kind of gave up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't get very far. And I mean, was there a lot of post game stuff, or was it all like the submissions? Like this one had that. I, I think the first game had the dedicated side quest too. Um, yeah, there there are quests for both. Um, but the post game in two is really just filling out a lot of the blanks from the first game. The only really new stuff that you can focus on in two after you beat the main game is finishing up all the minutia for the compendium. Um, yeah getting getting a whole round with everyone and then completing the dimensional dungeons the dimensional dungeons are the meat of the new game of the uh, post game and that was pretty much it yeah that's what i didn't get into i couldn't remember the name of them that's okay nobody blames you for that (laughs) and yeah i i when i loaded it up a month ago i looked and Gosh, I maybe had opened four dimensional dungeons total, and I know there were more than that. Yeah, there's like, gosh, I think there's maybe like 18. Wow. Yeah, I didn't get very far in those. And I know my son, like this game has 110 hours on it too. Um, My save files were oddly like five minutes apart in the two games uh, when I loaded them up last month. But in this one... um, I would have to probably say 30 to 40 hours of that 110, maybe even 50 hours, was done by my son. He'd put it in for an hour after school when he was coming home from preschool. My wife would text me, like, is it okay if he plays it? And I'm like, well, it's open world. He pretty much just walks around and likes to fight the golems the most. Um, I, I don't care, whatever. And he he didn't gave me very many levels because... I hadn't met like in the first game where I had everybody at level 99 and he would just repeatedly play the final boss. This one, he would just walk around the world and luckily it's got the auto save. And I mean, he kind of knew how to save, but even if he screwed stuff up, um, I always, I always had like my great save down at like the 10th position. So even if he was clicking on stuff, he probably wouldn't screw that one up. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, he, and he, would complain to me that he didn't like doing the dimensional dungeons because I think and he used to have a name for it. Like, I don't like to go to that place where you have to fight four different places. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, um, that was one of the early dimensional dungeons. Yep. Um because that was about the only one I had unlocked for the most part. Yeah, that's, that's the main trick with the dimensional dungeons is each dimensional dungeon has a required level that you're supposed to have before you get there. But the mm-hmm. trick they do, the, na- the nasty, nasty trick they do is that the required level is actually a low ball figure so i mean you'll get like level tw- uh, the one you're talking i forget what it's called but you're in the middle of the forest in this crossroads and it's a tower defense mission and there are and there are four pathways radiating out from the center and your job is to defend the it's not a root i think it's a it's a gem i think uh from uh being destroyed and you have four night moths at the end of these pa- these four pathways and they're all just spawning monsters so you have to run around and you have to fight your way to the maw keeper for each one and you have to kill it and you have to go back and find it and kill a way through another one and then you have to go back and find a way and kill the third and fourth one and then around maybe when you're about 75 percent done with the first round they summon extra night moths for an extra round and the trick is these are monsters that you would not be facing until you were in like your late 30s. The required level is level 20. These are like level 35 and up monsters. So they it, they really run you ragged trying to get you on point to the part where you can legitimately defend your tower because otherwise you simply cannot do enough damage to beat that level. And I hated that. I, I've, I've made, I think, maybe half a dozen jokes about how the dimensional dungeons are awful in the den, and every time Aaron just has this new little exclamation point above her head signifying she's got a new dimensional dungeon for me, I immediately run and save because I'm, I'm groaning internally, preparing myself for even more death in the future. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we didn't really talk about in the last game is the whole monster minions thing where in the first game you could collect coins and you know you beat you beat a monster sometimes they drop a coin and you could immediately load them up to have as a companion fighting next to your people um i thought one of the coolest things that dragon quest heroes 2 did was they had different different ways of doing that like there were three different kinds of monster minions that you could summon using the coins um 
was that they had the same ones as the first game where you could just they'd be standing there defending the area you loaded them up in but some of the monsters you could turn into for a while you could turn into a golem that was pretty cool and the uh oh thing in percy the saber cat you could turn into the saber cat and just run around for a while and have a couple different attacks that you could do as them. And then the ones that I didn't use as much were you had monsters, although they were quite useful in some spots. There were the monsters that you could call up that basically just cast a spell and disappear. Like you could call up the rock farm and he would just explode and kill a bunch of people around you. Or I want to say the little imps or the little devil guys, one of them cast, um, was it oomph on you or... Not one well, of there was one one of them made you big and oh that was it all. oh yeah it was the ones that made you big that was awesome like your character just triple in size quadruple in size and you'd walk around around for 30 seconds or so doing that that's the ones i really remember that was pretty cool yeah i really do appreciate about the heroes too they took a lot of time to really develop on the mechanics they'd already established um the monster medals are a great example they gave you three kinds i think in the first one uh you were only allowed to summon monsters and once you summon them they had occasion some of them had special effects for you that they would use once and then they just go about their business fighting other monsters Mm -hmm. but uh, heroes heroes too gives you options you get to summon allies you get to summon one time off special effect or you get to become the monster which was great if you were low on hp and you really really needed to avoid dying for three seconds (laughs) yeah (laughs) because those guys were invincible oh that's true yeah you could just i and i think my favorite one was the saber cat because there was the move where you would just spin around and man i found it to be like a oh yeah the wheeling circle of death. Yes. I become death, destroyer of nations. <laughs> I use that to finish some levels just because you could just spam that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really that, easy, that was... really strong, really useful. Yes, I remember that now, yeah. Yeah, because they were kind of classified as, like, didn't they kind of like saviors and ones that were, like, stationary as, like, a guard? Was yeah, kind of classification something else, yeah. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. I liked, um, you know, a little something minor that got tweaked but i really caught my attention throughout the game because in the first game uh, there was that one mission that you could spam over and over again and just get tons of mini medals with bianca's with the spawning and the using her reign of pain area in one spot mini medals really weren't a big deal in the first game if i needed them i knew where i could go and in 10 minutes get like 20 of them pretty quickly um the second game there wasn't that i know what i used to get monster medals a lot the second game was the monster suppression totals that you would get and in the first game like you were talking brother jaybird about how they put some time into thinking about it like in the first game, you, there was that one booth you could go up to, and it'd be like, hey, you killed 100 slimes. Here's a mon- monster medal. Uh, or you'd get a mini medal. Or, and then you killed 200 slimes, 300 slimes, 400 slimes, 500 slimes. They'd give you a mini medal for each one of them. The stupid thing in the first game is that 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 was the same for every monster. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they were, they were like bosses, and you were like, have a mini metal yeah it was like bosses and it'd be like you'd go up there and you've beaten this boss twice and you're like i'm never gonna beat him a hundred times to get that mini metal for that um they act they scaled all those numbers per monster in the second game so whereas like in the first game you'd have to beat a hundred king metal slimes to get a mini metal and then 200 300 400 yeah i mean you've never seen that playing 100 hours i never saw 100 king metal slimes but in the second game i specifically and i wrote this one down i went in i was looking at it and i'm like oh i remember i love this so much like it, the levels to get your first mini metal was beat one king metal slime and then you could get another one for beating two three i think it was like two three five and then ten yeah would give that you that. so oh, yeah it, it definitely scaled by the rarity of the monster so I mean a little change, but it was something that helped a lot in getting some of those mini medals. Which, by the way, it was pretty hilarious that the guy you trained in the middle mini medals for this was a platy punk that looked like he was a freaking '90s rapper. What do you want? <laughs> he, he, was, he was the mobster. Yeah. He was the mobster king. I love I love how they kept that reference yeah. because in and, uh, yeah. Heroes Rocket Slime, uh, platy punks are the bad guys, and they're mm-hmm. the mafia. The Platypunk yeah. Mafia. So I like that they kept the... He's wearing the regalia and the crown in Heroes 2, but he's got the mobster 
mojo going on in his uh, dialogue. What do you want? Now scram! I love that. Yep, that was definitely one of the good voice ones to use that you could hear. Oh, I heard a lot. I heard a lot because I really did try to focus on getting good gear and stuff through that. Um, Because that was something else that I thought this game was maybe a bit weaker in. Like in Dragon Quest Heroes 1, I felt I could keep up with everybody's equipment and have everybody decent accessories. Um because accessories the way they worked in the first game is you just made the accessory and depending on what materials you had you got like what three different ranks of accessories it'd be like the silver rank the gold rank and the platinum rank of accessories and you know if you're doing like the ruby of protection um you might have one way to make it where it gave you like plus five defense but if you use higher level ingredients it would come out a little bit higher quality and be like plus 10 defense or the highest level plus 15 defense Uh um whereas in this one every accessory you could um upgrade 12 times yeah they got this little path and each path requires certain ingredients and like you could get different accessories like different ingredient requirements depending on which which instance of the accessory like so if you had three different sets of slime earrings uh, each of them could require different sets of ingredients out of the same pool, but at different times. So you, they could, they were randomly generated, and you couldn't get all the way very quickly because you may just have gotten uh, the the random number god may have disfavored you, and you got <laughs> the ingredient requirements that you simply didn't have. No. Very true. And, you know, I I felt that I just couldn't keep up with all the weapons, all those defense orbs. I ended up, um, what I had had to do, I remember I had, like, four defense orbs that, like, always buying the best. I could only keep up with four of them. And maybe the weapons, money-wise, I I just felt like I didn't have enough money to keep everybody up to date. And with those accessories, since you had to spend so many rare materials or whatever continuing to upgrade them, like, my son would want to play... And he would tell me, he's like, Daddy, I want to use this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And I'd have to spend like three minutes taking all of the equipment off the people and then putting them on the other people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was another reason that I didn't switch around as much. I I don't know, man. I just couldn't keep up money-wise with everybody's stuff. It was like, man, there are way too many mouths to feed and the stuff just isn't, (laughs) the stuff isn't dropping. And like, I can't does everybody get like two or three accessories again? And like, I can't keep upgrading 36 freaking accessories. <laughs> 36, so, 36 accessories. Yeah. It, it was just, it, it was so much that, uh, and so I think all that subtly played into me just keeping that party of four and not really experimenting as much this time. I mean, objectively from every angle, the, this was the much better game I had from a gameplay standpoint. I enjoyed this at almost every level more, but, I played the first one more. From a customization standpoint, it's a bit more tedious. Correct. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was multiplayer in this too, right? I know that Patty and I had talked about um, signing on to the multiplayer until we found out you had to pay for like the PSN subscription, so we didn't do it. Um, but did anyone take advantage of that? I did not, but uh, the multiplayer was mostly a dungeon cooperation. I think a couple of uh, competition instances. You could go in and rescue other players who had died. You could go and help them clear missions. Uh, that was really big on the dimensional dungeons. I, I'm pretty sure most of those the very, very tail end of the dimensional dungeons were specifically designed to be too tough for just one person. Because Heroes 2 inherited one of the worst things from Heroes 1, the AI. So you could not rely <laughs> on characters to make intelligent decisions unless you were currently playing them. Which made a lot of the later tower defense missions really obnoxious. I do remember I helped out on some of the... Because I did have the PlayStation Plus and I helped out a lot. Uh, there, I remember there was one mission... Well, I know it was a, it was like a canyon and it... You had to defend the back, and then there were mock hippers down three paths down the middle. And I know I had a hell of a time with that mission when I played through it. So when I got leveled up, I'd always look for that mission, other people that were getting stuck on it. And I'd just go on and start knocking out the mock keepers so they could help defend the front line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was another thing to handle. Mock keeper management was another big thing about both this game and Heroes 1, but especially Heroes 2, because they put... Um, 
they streamlined a lot of the gameplay to a sense where they focused on only a few things. So they would take more care for mock keeper placements. They do uh, more hurdles like throwing multiple mock keepers at you. And so a certain tricks involved basically just skipping all the monsters that were summoned by the maw and just going for the mock keeper directly just to shut them up faster. Yeah, I agree. I think that mission that I'm talking about, which I can't remember what it was called, was the one where I learned that. It's like you were better off bum rushing the maw keeper and trying to at least knock one or two out before the main wave gets to your your tower defense area you got to protect mm -hmm. then you were standing around waiting to deal with the mob yeah take out take out the bosses now so there's less of a of a horde to deal with later yeah exactly mm -hmm. and didn't they improve the the healing crystals from 1 to 2 they i remember did. it being a nuisance in one well, the first one in the first game you had to pay for them you had to pay that's what it was in this game they got you got uh they were all restored for free to their max level which yeah, was when a, they was a like when you went to the inn right yeah yeah and you 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 could use them in the field but every time you went back to town they would meet you would get topped off automatically completely for free in the first game you had to spend certain amount of money on each stone to fill it up to a certain level like so yeah you'd up to not not necessarily four thousand, but like up to four thousand gold, depending on how full you wanted your heal stone to be, and you had to do it for every single one. So that was a good money sink. Yeah, I remember hating that in the first one, and I'm glad they changed that for the second one. Yes, I, it was funny because I think uh, I did. I, now actually thinking back a month and a half ago, I did play like half an hour to an hour of Dragon Quest Heroes One, and. I went to use one of those and it didn't work. I was like, "What the hell?" And I realized they were all empty, and I had to go back. And I mean, I've, that game that I got in level ninety-nine. I mean, I've got millions of gold. There's no problem. But and it was annoying because you had to talk to that lady and like, "Oh, what do you want to do with this one?" Okay, max heal, all heal. Talk to her every time. So if you had like eight stones, you actually had to talk to her and do each one individually. Yeah, you had to buy eight heal stones yeah. every time yeah. you wanted to pop yourself off. And I was like, ugh. Yep, so you were just sitting there hitting a, 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 like over and over and over again. You know, which was the, what the rest of the game was anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> the button, button masher. Just to get yourself back up to step, back up to snuff. Yeah. yeah. So when we were talking about 9 earlier, it made me think for some reason about this. You know, since 9 was originally supposed to be an action game and they took it back to being a turn base, do you think they went down this road with Heroes to scratch that itch for the people that wanted a real-time game? Oh, gosh, I, I didn't think of that. But thinking back, I can see a lot of action elements in 9. Um, especially the combat where they take time to, you know, basically animate all the characters running around the field and fighting monsters one on one. I can I can see that. Um, I don't know if they deliberately went full action with this time just to scratch an itch, but I, I can see it as this was one of the genres they hadn't branched out into yet because. I mean, not like anybody's saying anybody wants, you know, DQ carts anytime soon. It would be <laughs> phenomenal, but, you know, nobody would play it. Um, but this is, this is, I think, a natural evolution for the franchise because it's basically, it was a basically already implied by the RPG itself. It's just RPGs do it in a very deliberate, methodical, turn-based way, and the, it's a simulation of basically real-time combat so actually having a real-time combat game is not you know far afield and i mean the, these are what in japan are called muso games so yeah. this is already a, this is already a genre that's established but you know maybe that was an impetus between like hey we wanted to do this the japanese fans told us that really wasn't a what they wanted so maybe we instead of doing this maybe we need to find someone we can license this out to that already does it and help us make the game as a side quest that we want to yeah and on the same scroll i'd like to see a dragon quest heroes swords kind of mix where you got the mass monsters but you actually get to swing the sword like in swords but with oh, man. A better reaction you want to get the joy cons going yeah that's kind of what dragon quest vr is yeah and maybe they'll get to that point at some point for yeah. you know the so vr which yeah. would be awesome yeah, I mean, when I played the VR in Japan, it was like it was, you know, having played Hero um, Swords already. It just reminded me of that. It's basically a, a much more advanced version of Dragon Quest Swords with a, with a lot more mobility. So yeah, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see more of that in the future. Just without the virus. <laughs> 
Are you talking about the, 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 uh, the Dragon Quest Your Story virus or the COVID yeah. virus? No, oh, no, your story. <laughs> I didn't know what <laughs> virus. Going to be uh, I, I honestly didn't know which virus you meant. It's it's like almost 1 a.m. here right now while we're recording this, so I didn't know. <laughs> well, you know, you really don't you really don't want your copy of the game to co- come with a COVID-19 either. So. Well, yeah, but I, I, I usually carry a slime on me in, in, in hopes that it'll be the antivirus like it is in the film. Sorry for the spoilers. <laughs> so anything else that we didn't get into that you want to touch on in this game? I mean, I... I, I kind of touched on the side quests, and I, I think one of the big reasons I didn't do a lot in this game is they were very character specific. They were very much like, "Hey, you need to bring Maya and Mina with you to this side quest," and you know, or you need to bring Angelo and Jessica to this side quest. I felt like they also paired up the characters from the games we were with with that. But because I, Brother Jaybird, I think you put it well, the item management, the inventory control. And like, I was like, ah, gosh, I haven't been using these people. I don't want to spend five minutes taking all my stuff off, putting all stuff on, making sure I get them buffed off just so I can complete this side quest. I, I really didn't do a lot of side quests. I went to the booth five weeks ago and I looked at how many were there that I just hadn't even touched. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm embarrassed. I mean... <laughs> I'm a bad RPG player. I'm a I bad have... quest fan. I don't play the full game. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I mean, I'm... I... go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I would like to make one shout out. Uh, something that I really appreciated about Heroes 2 was they spent more time developing their guest characters, um, not amongst themselves, uh, but between generations of game. Um, Heroes 1 had that. But all the groups were kind of self-contained. It was Bianca and Nera off to the side. It was Elena and uh, Kirill off to the side. Maya was wandering off by herself. So it was like there wasn't a lot of interconnection between these two. Heroes 2 actually had those interconnections. Um, not a lot of them, but what was there was actually pretty neat. Uh, Torneco got to play the cool uncle for Ruff, which was appreciated. Uh, there is one glorious bit of dialogue during the initial um, march on the Ingeni- on the grounds of Ingenia, where Carver is a little touched uh, by uh, how sweet it is that Maya and Mina are getting along, and he decides, oh, you know, I think I'd like a middle- little sister of my own. And he looks around, and who should he see but Maribel? And he goes, hey, you want a big brother? And Maribel is just going, uh, no, no, thank you. I appreciate it, but no. I was like, that was delightful. I, I'd really have loved to see more of that. But if this this game came, let's see, what was the time difference on these games? Like a year and a half? Yeah. Yeah, I would have I would have really preferred if they, they kept it another at least half a year and spent more time developing these out because they gave us a taste and now I just want more. A mm-hmm. um, couple of cool shout outs. Um, I forgot to mention this in the first DQH episode, but uh, Terry is American. He's definitely got that kind of American accent. <laughs> I just thought it was kind of funny because he's the most arrogant character in the whole game. And, and they happen to make him American, whereas everybody else is either you know, <laughs> some form of British, uh, some uh, Indian, uh, Russian. You know, they, they have all these different uh, uh, countries, and then the, they make the arrogant guy the American, which I thought was kind of interesting voice casting because, <laughs> in a lot of ways, that's how Japan sees us as uh, when when we come to visit their country as foreigners. You um, asked for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> lightning storm but no just even just like how uh, he shows up in the beginning of dqh1 and he's just super arrogant and like he's a, he's a loner he, he, he wants to do everything himself he thinks he can take on the whole uh, monster horde by himself and everything. so i just thought that was kind of funny at some point you know maybe being the monster master got to his head <laughs> <laughs> and he just became, he grew up and became the most arrogant teenage American <laughs> he could possibly be. He did. He, <laughs> he, he did kind of turn, let's let's stop talking about Heroes 2 and jump into the lore of another couple of games, why don't we? Uh, yeah, he really did um, turn, into a, turn into a bit of a creep growing up in 6. He's a lot sweeter in his backstory in Monsters 1. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you mentioned on the last me- uh, episode, uh, one of you was reading Monsters Plus. Liam, was that you? Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah so the, the first book is is very much about like they're you know Terry kind of a throwback to to his time as the monster master and now they're looking for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So that that was uh, something I recall. I read the I read a, a fan translation, I think, of the first book of Monsters Plus. So I, I recall when you, when you immediately when you started talking about it last time, I started remembering. I re- I think I kind of recall this. I think I kind of do. Maybe oh. sort of a little bit. And wait till you get into book two and three and four, Terry. You know, talk about more of a dick. Uh, We'll save that for a spoiler cast on those, but uh, Liam, I don't know if you've made it into book two. No, I, I didn't make it past once the uh, the dragon gets sliced up to pieces by, by, the, <laughs> by one of the characters, um, and my son was like, oh, I want to stop reading. I, I just kind of put it down, but I, I will mm. pick it back up for those uh, those podcasts when we do them. Yeah, I think another thing to look out for is the artist who draws those, the Monster Plus, I forget his name, but he's also the guy who does um, Sergeant Frog the Sergeant Frog manga, uh, or Kerodo Gunsel, I think its name is. And he, he's pretty known for his fan service quotient. Uh, so I would I would be wary if you're showing that to younger children. So make sure you get, you know, a good read on the whole thing in advance. <laughs> so you're not, you know, just wandering along and then you stumble into something inadvertently and have a sudden unfortunate uh, conversation that you suddenly need to have with your kids. Oh, boy. A- yeah. Any last uh, thoughts here? I know, I see, Liam, you... Uh put a little something that it would be great to discuss here at the end. Um, but before we do, would us anything else about this game that stood out to you that you think of? No, I think we've covered most of it, at least what I can remember, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the PAX East promotion was pretty, was pretty good too. It wasn't, um, it wasn't quite the demo they had for DQ H1, uh, where you had the, um, the, the like fight Giganties and get your name and picture taken with, uh, with Helix. They had, they did have a pose contest, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't exactly like a, as as built up as as the first one, but they did have some cool cosplay. Again, Mishi was there, and uh, Favorian. They were both uh, Teresa and um, uh, Lazarel, respectively. <laughs> um, this was uh, when Kaori Takasu was in charge of the uh, the marketing for DQH2. So they had Helix, the heel slime, was there as well. Um, like he was uh, in the uh, in the first promotion. So yeah, it was really cool to see all of that at the Square Enix booth. And um, I think we have some photos that I can uh, post to the YouTube version of that as well. Yeah, send me those, please. Um, all right. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Ask, I was gonna say, go ahead and ask that last question you put on there. <laughs> sure. Uh, so we we were talking. I was inspired by some of the conversations about uh, that that uh, um, Jaybird you were talking about in terms of like what what you wanna what you would have liked to see. Um, what would you like to see in a Dragon Quest Heroes three? Oh gosh. Situations. Oh gosh. What wouldn't I like to see? Um, well, uh, more characters is the easy one to go through. Go to. Uh, I think. I think when we were talked, we talked about this on the den for a bit, and I think that a few of us got behind a lot of extra party members from games that were so far been underrepresented. Because what Heroes does so far is it goes for character, it goes for the characters in different games, and some of us were thinking we might like other side characters from other games, like some of the uh, class specifics from three, or maybe even the princess and uh, the the princess and princess from two. Or maybe even uh, one, maybe in a, in a once in a blue moon, one or two of the heroes themselves, and see what they'd look like with an actual personality. Um, Mori, I think, was a favorite for those. Um, let's see, what else was I thinking of? Um, one of the, I remember it now. Uh, one of the things that I really wanted to see was uh, combination attacks and more interactions. Um, because I really loved, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I mentioned uh, I loved the characters interacting with each other, and I really, really wanted to see more. And I, I realized that um, this game has the what was it called? The tag team attacks, the tag throw. No, not tag throws. That's uh, something else. Um, but you could switch between characters and um, combo into one another's attacks. I would have loved mm-hmm. to see something like you had if you had specific characters in the same party and you set them up correctly, they could segue into special shared techniques rather than just segue into one of their own. You know, it's interesting you mention more characters and I'm like, oh man, maybe not as many repeats. I, I think mm-hmm. I'd like to see those. I'd like to see different ones. I guess is the thing. I don't need a. I don't need a twenty or thirty characters in this game because I think. Man, I don't know how they do those item management, but I, I got so bogged down by that in the second one. But no, I'd like to see different ones. I want to see people we haven't seen before. Um, and I think even like Florette from 
Yeah, I was thinking that too. Swords or something. Maybe the more popular ones from mm-hmm. a couple other ones would be Sylvando. cool to have in the... Sylvando. Yeah, well, I was Sylvando. gonna say, yeah, you're gonna have to have a couple Dragon Quest Eleven people, and Sylvando yeah, would be definitely, great. Definitely Sylvando and um, uh, who else from Eleven? I well, would definitely. Uh, well, Jade would be your eye candy. Oh yeah, Jade, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I just much because, anyone I, from Eleven. <laughs> I, I was gonna say it's kind of hard. Hendrick. Everybody. Everybody had a lot different weapons in the uh, Dragon Quest Heroes 2. There was very specific weapon trees for everybody, or just weapons in general, which made it a lot harder to buy. I'd like to see them like put that thought into the Dragon Quest Heroes 3 too, and let's not have five sword guys like we did in the first game that's what smash brothers is for (laughs) exactly (laughs) maybe they could switch to the skill trees like 11 used more yeah i mean there's definitely ways that they could do that and you know if you wanted to have those weapons you could um playing through hyrule warriors gosh those game like hyrule warriors you could easily sink 200 hours into with a lot of these post game actually not really story but um very specific quests that you had to go on go to this map kill a hundred people and do the or a thousand people and do this or defeat this guy in a certain amount of time um but you'd get a lot of weapon drops a lot of the um other muso games deal with weapon drops i don't think you need that here but um with all those weapon drops what they did is y- each person could do a- different things like link could have swords or link could have wands or link could have something else in hyrule warriors um so maybe combining brian with what you said like the skill trees like yeah give everybody the option of three different weapons yeah i something that uh, that reminds me is hyrule warriors if i recall correctly did something where they would you you got different ranks of weapons and what mm-hmm. would happen is you'd have to unlock each rank by completing a specific quest in the background but then once you unlocked it, it would start randomly generating during, over the course of your normal gameplay, which mm-hmm. I found to be a much more appealing system than having to go out of your way to get to this one specific level and then having to go through all this tedium to do it again a second time. Mm-hmm. It was much less tedious in uh, Hyrule Warriors. Correct. Yeah, I mean, and I played Hyrule Warriors for all of 30 hours, but, I mean, there's there's actual things to do and things to unlock and stuff to go on for hundreds of hours in that game. And Fire Emblem Warriors has a lot of the um, history modes where you play through old scenarios by going through and doing these. So that'd be cool to bring back some kind of scenarios from old Dragon Quest games. Not just, hey, go fight Zoma. <laughs> but an actual <laughs> goal. Mm-hmm. Maybe bring back a town and like, hey, we're going to do a Lumen um, Tower Defense one from Dragon Quest Seven, Or what is it called now? Oh, not again. The town of not again, the one that you had to go save three different times. Yep. You know, hearing you say that out loud, I think that's the first time I've gotten that joke because I would read it dozens of times and it never actually sunk in until you just said it out loud. <laughs> somebody else had this problem on an earlier cast, so don't blame me. Oh yeah. Oh, oh somebody no. Po- Xerox was... is that the one? Yeah, that was at Xerox. Now I'm laughing yep. at Xerox. Uh, what did I read a thousand times? But until somebody posted just last week on the den or a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dia Diamonds, what the Resurrection Rocks turned into, and mm-hmm. it. Like a pun on diamonds, but it's die, D-I-E-A, mend. And like, oh shit, it's mending you from dying. It's keeping you from dying. Oh my god, it didn't even click until somebody posted about that recently. Well, that's the best part, though. You I mean, you can play these games for years and catch one of these things. Yeah. What did you call it, Liam? The uh, pun pun bombs or the pun landmines or something that they just go off years later? Oh, I don't know. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> you call it... You, you had some name for it a long time ago. When we were talking about the Xerox, you were like, yeah, it's just those pun like, bombs. Or... I don't know, maybe a joke grenade? There's a maybe, late yeah. line joke in here somewhere that I'm too tired to make. <laughs> yeah, it's it's late. <laughs> All right, so on that note... Oh, wait, uh, and... I did want to say that if, if we're a DQH3, uh, I'd love to see that co-op play idea um, that came from oh. uh, uh, Hyrule Heroes, the, the Wii U version. Uh, I'm not well, sure. If it's you... on the Switch, and yeah. Fire Emblem Warriors has it on the Switch, too. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, some of the newer games that came out for Switch did that. Um, and actually, both of those games were on Wii U and 3DS beforehand. Um, probably the 3DS didn't have a couch co-op, but no, I, I definitely want to. I mean, that's how I've brought my son into 
more of the gaming like I like recently is there, I'm finding all these couch co-op games that we can both be sitting there and playing together. I mean, heck, even Let's Go Pikachu, which I got just kind of thrown in when I bought my Wii, um, my Switch used last year. I kind of had it, and I was like, eh, I don't want this game. I don't want to play through Pokemon Gen 1 for like the millionth time. But here we are playing two yeah. hours a day with it <laughs> because we can both be battling at the same time oh like so all... I, I, uh, speaking of switch though did i tell you that um my wife wants to get a switch now too Woo! Cool. Yeah. it should be great if we could find one but we're in you covid we're in covid world here where like where immediately when the when the government started saying stay home all of the available switches were bought up by people and so now they're <laughs> sold out everywhere except for the price gougers mm-hmm so yeah, this is uh, the but um, there's a Taiko drumming game, um, a Japanese drumming game that my wife wants for our son. Uh, so um, and it comes with like a little drum controller and everything like that. So um, yeah, if we could just find a switch, we could get it now. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not paying like crazy amounts of money for it. So, so I, just, I mean, it's everything, and you've just had the bad timing on this one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the, it's exactly like the Falcon Blade. The Switch is my Falcon Blade. <laughs> I like the little note of despair that entered his voice just now. If we could <laughs> find the Switch, <laughs> we're so close. Find the so close. Uh, well. Cheer up. I, I keep seeing Japan or Nintendo saying that they're working on it. They know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, just hope it doesn't turn into like StubHub now, or that becomes a thing where everyone just immediately, you know, uses algorithms to buy up all the switches and put them on eBay for $300 more. I've been trying to get the Wii Fit game, or not, not Wii Fit. Oh, uh, the Ring Fit Adventure for the Switch. Well, didn't Yanga say he saw a bunch of them around here? I know. Yeah. He said that. And then I mentioned that I wanted one, and then he never followed up. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Are people exercising more? Is that what's going on? Or? Actually, they've been out of stock since like January. From what I understand is the Switch just came out, and this may be part of why the Switch is out. The Switch just came out um, end of the year, maybe towards the end of last year in China as well. And a lot of they apparently working out at home in China was a big thing. And I like I tried to get Ring Fit Adventure, I want to say end of January. I started thinking like, oh, yeah, I want to get this. We've been working out in the home gym more, and because Ring Fit Adventure is actually a role-playing game. Like, you could, like, do stomps to attack, so it's not just like, hey, do these exercises. I'm like, well, that'll be fun to do. It's actually an RPG, and reading the reviews, it's like an 80-hour RPG, and I'm like, man, if something will get me working out for 80 hours, <laughs> I'll play for that. But, yeah, it's since, like, January, it's been out of stock, and I've read one of the big things is, um, like, all, Australian retailers were shipping, selling them to Chinese sellers to that resell to people in China for premium prices. So hmm. just another thing that not even domestically in high demand, it's internationally in high demand. And, you know, you can't, what sucks is uh, you can't buy the game digitally because there's tons of people on, um, what is it, eBay and Amazon that are selling like the accessories that you slide the Joy-Cons in. But Nintendo doesn't like that. They don't want people buying third-party accessories to do the game. So it's not available digital. The only way to get the game is to have a physical copy of the game bought with Nintendo's plastic pieces. <laughs> yeah, Nintendo is pretty uh, strict when it comes to proprietary management. Mm -hmm. It'd be like, you know, there's a bunch of Duck Hunt guns out there, but unless you have the actual Duck Hunt cartridge, you can't play with it. <laughs> and an old-school TV. And an old-school TV. <laughs> So it's the modern day equivalent of that. Hey, maybe for uh, Dragon Quest Heroes 3, they could reverse Rocket Slime. Instead of Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime, it could be Rocket Slime Heroes, and then they could be all slime characters you play with. Oh my god, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'd be happy getting Rocket as a character in DQH3. I think that would be pretty That would be delightful. Especially if he comes with his own cannon or mech. Just, you, you're, you're basically oh, that'd be awesome. You can out. Although, and yeah, now we need be... a slime tank game. Yeah, that would be game-breaking. <laughs> just, just a slime mech game. It's a Muto <laughs> game where a giant mech shows up and starts blasting things, blasting real, items. Real-time 3D. <laughs> Sorry to scroll back onto topic. No, that's fine. All right, and on that note, I think uh, we'll head into the ending here. I guess that's it for this episode of Slime Time. We do want to thank Brother Jay Bird for joining us to talk about um, this awesome game. Thanks for having me. I'm flattered. Thanks so much, Brother Jay Bird. Yeah. 
Uh, so you might have noticed that the only time we mention Patreon on our podcast is when we say we don't use Patreon. We're just long-term fans that want to speak about the game series we know, we love so much. So if you have money you would like to donate, consider sliding on over to the Dragon's Den at www.wudis.com den. Click on support this site. Um, Wudis, who's on this episode with us, he's owned and maintained that site for over 20 years. He'd appreciate any donation, or you can use his Amazon affiliate link. You can buy Dragon Quest Heroes, Dragon Quest Heroes 2, Dragon Quest Heroes 11, 11S, whatever else has got linked there. He's got a bunch of them linked, and he'll get a little fraction of the sale going to support the den. And if you're an advertiser looking for a cool new podcast to spend lots of ad revenue on, reach out to us at slimetimepodcast at gmail.com. If you have any questions or comments for us, you can find us on Twitter at platym 3 or at Riamu Celestrian, or hit us up both simultaneously at DQ Slime Time. Also, please uh, be sure to join our new Instagram account also what is our instagram account <laughs> also at dq slime time all right um brother jaybird are you on twitter or instagram not not really no I, I i occasionally look to find interesting things but i don't i don't have a personal account all right so find brother jaybird at the dragon's den join him on the forums where we've got lots of dq discussions going on it's one of the uh few maybe the only remaining dragon quest forums still around <laughs> forum period there's not a lot of forum work going on discord's killed everything thanks a lot discord <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can find the den forums on the main page um what i said earlier or www.wudis.com forums i'm there talking a lot about it brother jaybird's diving deep into a lot of the stuff um and with everybody the, else is the heroes nice games <laughs> and he's also you can hear his experiences exploring Dragon Quest XI for the first time. So uh, go ahead, do that. Uh, and we'd like to thank everyone else that made this possible, like Wudis. Thank you very much for the support of the series and this podcast and for keeping the Den's lights on for decades. And thanks to Amanda LaPree and the Descendants of Erdrick for allowing us to use their music for our podcast. Descendants of Erdrick is a video game tribute band from Austin, Texas. If you like what you've heard, check them out in their most recent album, Advent, at www.descendantsofurdrick.com or on Twitter at D of Erdrick. Or once the coronavirus stuff is all, all over with, uh, go see their band leader Amanda LaPree live on tour as a guitar with Andrew Dibb. Ah, uh, speaking of Instagram, thanks to our friend Dwayne Bullock, our graphic artist. Uh, you can find him on Instagram at Dwayne Art or at his website, DwayneBullockArt.BigCartel.com. He uh, made the awesome artwork cover for this pad podcast, and he's been on a few times, as well as starring in the original iterations of Slime Time many years ago. And if you're looking for more DQ podcasts, check out our earlier episodes on Dragon's Den, Anchor FM, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and more. Please also check out our fellow Dragon Quest podcasts available like Puff Puff Hour and Dragon Quest FM. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Wudis. Thanks, Thank Brother Jaybird. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again. DQ Slime Time, sliming off. <laughs>